Is it open season on Harry and Meghan? What's behind William's big revelation? And are the royal family running out of cash? We'll have the answers to all that and more on this week's Palace Confidential. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Joe Elvin and here to discuss all the week's stories are the Daily Mail's royal editor Rebecca English and the paper's diary editor Richard Eden. Welcome, Dream Team. Welcome. Now, a reminder that if you don't already, make sure you subscribe to our channel and never miss another episode. Right, let's get going. This week, the royal family did its annual opening of the books where it revealed its finances to the media. Rebecca, I'm going to come to you first because you were one of those being briefed by the palace yesterday. And I know we joke about them running out of cash, those poor destitute royals, but the financial picture isn't actually that healthy, is it? I mean, don't don't worry too much, Joe. They're, won't they're sleep not on tonight. their uppers. I will you know, not sleep. You know that. But the, the kind of headline figure is that they spent more than they had coming in last year. So uh, spending went up by 5% to £107 million. That was largely because of the cost of uh, dealing with the sad death of Queen Elizabeth II and her funeral, uh, the change in rain, rampant inflation that's existing in this country, high energy bills. They're suffering the same kind of cost of living crisis as the rest of us, yes, but obviously so, from a palace. So, yeah. Yes, I believe the king is doing his bit to lower those energy bills. He is actually. So that was quite an interesting breakout from it that, you know, as part of driving down the bills but also trying to be a bit greener. Charles is obviously, because he's got a very good track record and this has come in, uh, all guns blazing, and he's making the staff turn down the thermostat on the heating <laughs> to a mere 19 degrees. Oh, that is such dad behaviour. Um, <laughs> in the winter. And if the room is empty, down to 16 degrees. Oh. And if you're not, if the rooms have not been used at the weekend, then the uh, radiators are turned off completely. Um, you know, there's lots of light switching. Um, I was told that not only has the temperature been turned down on the swimming pool, it's it's now not being heated at all, so no one can swim Stop in it. Stop talking, I'm oh, traumatised. I know. I'm I mean, traumatised you know. <laughs> by the thought of an unheated swimming pool. But, Richard, we can relax with the relieving news that the Royal Train is to be saved. I bet you're pleased. <laughs> the Royal Train, yes, I love the Royal Train. <laughs> how, how, how did you know? I think... Well, because we've discussed it at length before. I mean, look, people always complain about the cost of the Royal Train. I think this year they made the point that it was used only four times over the past year, so because of that it works out quite expensively. But surely the answer to that is, is use it more. You know, don't be using helicopters or other things go in the Royal Train. I mean, my goodness, I would, wouldn't you, if you had a Royal Train? I was in Yorkshire and Derbyshire at the weekend. If I could have um, avoided driving and taken my own train, I definitely would have done. Why do you love the train so much? Is this, does this hark back to some childhood, boyhood fantasy of He's being a train, a train driver? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you do uh, yeah. at the weekends, mean, Remember, the, the Royal Family lost Royal Yacht Britannia, which was you know, their most beloved um, form of transport for trips abroad and that sort of thing. And in, in my opinion, that was a, that was a great mistake. Um, so we don't want them to lose the train as well. But you know, the train's quite basic on the inside. Everyone mm -hmm. thinks it's, you know, something like the Orient Express and it was kind of done in the <laughs> 60s and hasn't really changed very much. Little single beds, little kind of, you know, wash basins. It's, it's, it, it's, it's surprising, the uh, the inside. It's, it's TARDIS-like, but it's surprisingly plain on okay, the inside. OK, so it needs an upgrade. That's what we need to campaign for, okay, an upgrade so, yeah. to yeah, the yeah, I'm not train. sure that's going to go sure down taxpayers will be well. thrilled to, to <laughs> fund the re revigoration of the train. <laughs> but it has, you're right, I mean, it's just to say, because I asked that question at the briefing yesterday, because you rightly said, I noticed it's only been used four times, which is an average cost of £30,000 a time. Um, but they made the point, and previously they told me in briefings that they would keep it for as long as Queen Elizabeth was alive because it was just a more comfortable way of her travelling overnight to jobs, mm. you know, gave her a secure place to sleep so they didn't have to use trains, you know, planes, not trains, planes and helicopters. Um, but we were told that it would be probably decommissioned after she died, which is why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I got the impression the King quite likes it too, so it's going to keep chugging on for the <laughs> foreseeable future. Good, good. Well, thank goodness for that. We can all breathe easy. Rebecca, we did discuss a little bit of this next topic in our last episode, and you can head back and check that afterwards if you missed it. But on Monday, we heard more about William's big plans to tackle homelessness. Yes, yeah, so it was the big launch that we kind of teased about last week, which saw him travel to six locations 
around the country. He's putting three million pounds of his royal foundation's money into this, and what they're trying to do is is really bring people together and eradicate the problem of homelessness in these six locations around the country, which they hopefully will spread elsewhere. I travelled with him to Sheffield to see what they were doing there, and there was certainly an incredibly warm reception on the ground. I mean, there have been some some cynicism saying, how can you solve a problem that you know, we've been trying to solve for decades in this country? Um, but certainly he's brought a sense of optimism to it that it was very, very clear on the ground. People mm. are very excited about this. Mm. Richard, you pointed out a, a rather interesting response from one of Charles's organisations on this news. Um, yes, this was um, Charles's, the King's great charity, which is the Prince's Foundation. And they um, shared images on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, pointing out that um, this was the fourth anniversary this week of King Charles's big um, project on um, homelessness. Ooh, that's a bit of a meow moment, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, certainly yeah. it was interesting timing. <laughs> but I, th I think it does relate to what we discussed last week, that, that there was concern among um, certainly some of the King's supporters that his son, William, wasn't really giving him enough credit for um, his venture. You know, he announced that there's been lots of references to Princess Diana, but there hasn't been any mention, remember, in that big Sunday Times interview of what... King Charles has done. He, he has built lots of social housing mm. in land that he was in charge of in the Duchy of Cornwall. Um, so there's a feeling that more credit should have been given, I think, to um, his father. I'll watch this space. But Rebecca, do you think that this sort of big launch shows the differences in how William does and will do things to his father? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, Charles, I think over the years, has been more of a slow burner. So you've got things like the Prince's Trust charity, which he set up in 1976 with the kind of payoff he got when he left the Navy. And uh, funny enough, there was a lot of criticism of that at the time, saying, you're, you know, you're doing things you shouldn't be doing as heir to the throne, you're verging on the political. And that's gone on to become one of the biggest charitable success stories in the country that's yeah. helped over a million young people over the years. I mean, there is, you know, nobody who is critical of the Prince's Trust now. But that has been a long, slow burn over many, many decades. And William's given himself quite an ambitious target of five years to um, solve these problems. But he, you know, he's a good convener and he's got some big names on board, so they seem very optimistic about it. And I think sometimes you need a target, don't you? We all know that as yeah. journalists, yeah, that yeah. a deadline helps <laughs> yeah. uh, encourage us. So if he says, this is what we hope to achieve over five years, it gives everyone a sort of, you know, kick up the backside. Cracking that whip. Well, that will be one to discuss in a future episode, I'm sure. We have lots more to come, including the latest in Harry and Meghan's Netflix and Spotify rows. But for now, Let's look at some of your comments. Oh, lots of you did not like the suggestion that the palace might have screwed up when William's big interview took his father's official birthday cover off front pages. Leanne Bond says that it was coordinated and very smart and that amid the traditional pageantry, it was a chance to show the positive work that they're doing. And lots of praise for that work, including from Cindy Faulkner, who believes that the Prince of Wales is launching this campaign from his heart rather than for any political reasons. A warm response to the Queen waving to her best friend in the whole world, our very own Rebecca, at the Order of the Garter ceremony. Head back to last week's to show that clip if you haven't seen that. And Denise Carringer called it a lovely bit of warmth and respect. Oh. Sealer's mum, meanwhile, wrote in about the news that Harry and Meghan's Spotify deal had been terminated, saying, I get the feeling that Harry and Meg's, Meg's bit informal, are kind of done. What else is there to say that anyone would want to hear? Fair enough, the Invictus series could be good, but who wants to see Harry hosting it? Not me. Well, thank you for all of those comments. Please keep them coming in. We do love to get them from you. Now, sticking with that topic, though, let's bring my panel back in, because, Rebecca, more details have emerged about Harry and Meghan's media activities, including a piece in the Wall Street Journal that isn't really your go-to place for royal stories normally, is it? It's not. I have to say, this yeah. was excoriating. I did, did, yeah. you, did you really? Yes. Yeah. It, it, it was... Yeah, and it seemed to be very well sourced, I have to say. Um, so it basically said that 
Spotify uh, pulled the plug on their deal with Harry and Meghan because they were completely underwhelmed by the lack of productivity. Uh, there was a particularly pithy line uh, saying that they'd been told by sources that Meghan had written a personal letter to the singer Taylor Swift asking her to take play part in the podcast but got a letter back from her personal assistant <laughs> uh, rather than uh, the lady herself. Um, it, 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 I mean, it, it, I have to say, it wasn't flattering at all. Um, I have to say, in response to that, uh, Netflix have come out via Hello Magazine and given a statement to them emphasising their commitment to the deal with the couple. But I have to say, the Wall Street Journal piece was, was not edifying reading for Harry and Meghan, put it that way. Me. I do feel for Meghan because Taylor Swift turned down my podcast as well, which is a kindred spirits. Come so on, you do Taylor. have something in Come common on, with Taylor. Them, Joe. Um, <laughs> now, Richard, you wrote a story in this week's Daily Mail that saw them face talking about them facing even more criticism. They're getting up from all sides. Oh, my goodness. It really does seem to be sort of open season on Harry and Meghan at the moment, doesn't it? These are extraordinary comments, really, because they came from one of Hollywood's um, top talent agents, mm -hmm. um, Jeremy Zimmer. And you know what it's like with these agents? Usually they're very diplomatic because um, even if someone's not their client now, they're always thinking, oh, they could be in the future. Uh, and they don't want to be seen to be criticizing stars, do they? Yeah, people? Yeah. But he was, um, it was a, a conversation he had with a reporter, and he talked about how. Um, he said not only um, was Meghan lacking any sort of talent for broadcasting, for, you know, podcasts, but she seemed to lack any talent at all. That is so which, harsh. Uh, I thought that was a, a, a bit unkind. I used to watch her in, um, before we knew her as we do now, I used to watch her in Suits. And yeah. She, she is a pretty good actress, you know. Yeah. Um, so she obviously has a talent for acting and, um, you know, other things perhaps. But that's the point that the Wall Street Journal was making. They said, you know, part of this problem is with Harry and Meghan is this kind of entire problem with the whole podcast in industry that there was a flurry to sign massive names and throw big monies at money at them without actually knowing if they had an idea that was workable this is now falling around the industry's ears and actually a lot of good people producers and engineers script writers, you know these people are losing their jobs mm. whereas people there's a lot of anger because people like harry and megan have walked away with still significant amounts of money so there's quite a lot of bad feeling about it yeah and i think jeremy zimmer's um comments should be seen in the context of he was talking about the move away from throwing money at famous people to do podcasts and how you know it's something which needs to be done professionally with a lot of effort not just because oh I need to get some money why don't you you know give me a deal which yeah. is, seems to be why there's this a bit of bad blood with Spotify really. It's fascinating. Well, ha well Harry sorry to interrupt Joe, yeah, but Harry, that's what Harry made clear he said well, when we left the royal family I was down to my last mm. few million um, poor love and mm. uh, we needed to get some money in quick so we did these deals he's been quite open about it hasn't well imagine he? if you're at a job interview you know and they say oh you know why do you want this job and you say well I just need a bit of money really, and really quickly that, that's, yeah. that's not gonna yeah. win you the job is it not not usually <laughs> um, Rebecca they were also Harry and Meghan in for some questioning from a pretty high profile figure here in the UK yesterday Yes, yeah, Sir Trevor Phillips. Now, he is a very respected uh, writer and broadcaster, particularly on race issues. Um, he was chairman of the Commission for Racial Equality. And he's been pretty scathing about them over a matter of weeks, actually. And it's been prompted by kind of Windrush anniversaries. But basically saying, effectively saying he was very disappointed in them, that he thought they could have been a real standard bearer for uh, multiracial Britain and felt very let down by them and, and felt that they'd kind of walked away too soon from not just the royal family but from this country. He's been very, very scathing of them. And presumably, Richard, all these sorts of stories just add pressure not only on them but whoever they might partner with next on a new contract. I think it does. I mean, it's an interesting one because if, um, for example, they bring out their ne next um, Netflix program, you know, there will be huge attention and focus on it. So, you know, Netflix might bring out some programs which are kind of average, but I think in their case, it would have to be really, really good, or they wouldn't want to bring it out because they know the sort of attention it brings. Mm. Um, and it's that kind of um, sort of toxic, slightly element to it you know if you've got talent agents that are willing to be so rude about you in public it, I can imagine it being quite off-putting to lots of people mm. he was quite rude though wasn't he <laughs> I mean that is to say someone's got no talent 
It's yeah. quite rude. I mean, maybe he meant it yeah. in, a, in a slightly jokey way, but mm. I think he'd clearly been um, listening to a few of her um, <gasps> podcasts. I'm not making any comment. Now, I want to move on, Rebecca. Let's let's talk about Sarah Ferguson for a moment oh, because yeah. we heard from her again this week on her podcast and she revealed her rather serious uh, health issues. Yeah, so I, in fact, I got a message on um, Sunday um, from uh, her people saying that we want you to know uh, that she's sadly been diagnosed with breast cancer. It, it, the positive news is they've caught it incredibly early. It is very treatable. Um, we didn't have much more detail at that stage apart from to say that she had been in hospital and undergone surgery. But she subsequently revealed on her new podcast, uh, Tea Talks, that she'd actually undergone a single mastectomy mm. um, and had, had reconstructive surgery. But again, you know, in a very Sarah way, putting huge positivity on the situation and saying, look, if I've got to go through this, I want people to know about it, whatever brickbats people throw at me. Because what saved her life was a really, a routine mammogram in an NHS hospital in the UK. She said she almost didn't go for the appointment because it was a hot day and could I be bothered travelling in London? And her sister was on the phone and said, no, no, you should go, go. Mm. And she said, thank God I did because it yeah. was the tiniest little shadow. And they said, you know what, we're just going to take another look at that. You know, she had no lump, no symptoms. It was because of the amazing care she got in this hospital in London um, that picked it up. So she said, you know, if I can help people and encourage people to go for, for scans and tests, not just for breast cancer, but for men, for, you know, prostate cancer, things like that, do it. Don't put it off. Don't put it off to tomorrow. No. Do it today because this is what saved my life, potentially. 100%. And all of us here at Palace Confidential certainly hope the Duchess recovers very quickly from that. It's awful news. But Richard, she also talked in this podcast about her daughters and the unpublicised work that they do. I know you're big fans of Eugenie <laughs> and Beatrice. What, what did you make of all of that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, she's um, a great fan of her own daughters, as, she, as, yeah. she, as you'd yeah. expect. Um, but she was just making the point that they do, you know, a lot of work in, in private as well. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to see them having more of a role. I think there's um, something I mentioned in my newsletter this week is, you know, it's possible that a lot of the royal patronages that the Queen and Prince Philip previously had, um, William and Catherine might not want to take them on. They're keener to focus on um, a few key issues. So there may be lots of patronages otherwise that would, would be lost. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I personally think it would be great if Beatrice or Eugenie could, could take on these patronages and, um, you know, carry out some royal duties. I mean, look, yes, they have jobs, you know, work in art gallery or something, but but you know maybe they could combine that with some royal duties. Mm. Obviously, that was difficult in Harry and Meghan's case, but that's a very different case because Harry and Meghan wants to go and make serious money. It doesn't seem like there's much appetite internally for that, though. Rebecca, do you think? Well, there wasn't certainly because you know, the whole point was that the king wanted to have a, a slim down monarchy. But you know, the monarchy has slimmed down a lot quicker uh, than he ever thought it was going to be, and they never thought they would be without Harry and his family um, supporting William along the way. Obviously, we've got a lot of older members of the royal family who will eventually, you know, retire from from duties and you know. Uh, and, and pass on, and, and we're soon going to be left with barely, you know, six, seven people. Um, and if we are expecting the same workload from them mm. um, as the public, you know, we want to see them doing work for this 86.3 million pounds we give them every year to untake their duties. They, they may need more help in doing it. I've always been resistant to Beatrice and Eugenie. I didn't think that was right, but I, th I think you could be right, Richard. Mm. I think maybe there might be an argument for that. You've been resistant to them. Well, I just think, um, very much like the Queen, you're either a full-time royal right, or, yeah. or you're not. Um, mm. And they do attend things like garden parties. You'll very occasionally see them at receptions. So it's, they've always been there on the fringes. But I think, you know, they need people who are more full-time committed to what they're doing to really make a difference in a meaningful way. Um, but maybe there is a different way of doing maybe it. Maybe the campaign starts here with you, Richard. <laughs> Let's see. Well, now we're going to stick with the Duchess of York for now because we thought we'd devote this week's montage to some of our favourite Fergie picks. <laughs>
Oh, the inimitable Fergie there. A reminder that all you need to do for more great royal content is like this episode and subscribe to our channel. My thanks to Rebecca and Richard and to you for watching as ever. Thank you. Goodbye.